Hello, and welcome to Black Artists Matter, an online variety show featuring the work of black performers from across the country. My name is Arif Silverman, and it has been an honor to be able to share my residency at the Dixon Place Lounge with these incredible performers. We're accepting donations for tonight's show. You can donate in the link below using your Venmo account. Half of the proceeds will be split evenly among the performers, and half of the proceeds will be given to Integrate NYC, which is a youth-led organization that fights for racial integration and equity in New York City schools. I'd like to thank Dixon Place's artistic director, Ellie Covan, for providing this virtual space. And I would also like to thank Dixon Place's artistic associate, Ashley Brockington, for her guidance in helping me develop this incredibly exciting night. Okay, that's enough out of me. Enjoy Black Artists Matter. God created black people and black people created style. The name's Ms. Raj, that's R-O-J, thank you. And you can find me every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday night at the bottomless pit, the watering hole for the wild and the weary, which asks the question, is there life after Labor Day? Yes. If it be black and swish, the BP has seen them. Which is not to suggest that the pit is lacking in cultural diversity. Oh no, there's your dinge queens, your white men who like their chicken legs dark. And let's not forget Los Muchachos de la Neighborhood. But the specialty of the house are the snap queens. We are a rare breed. For you see, when something strikes our fancy, when the truth comes piercing through the dark, you just can't let that pass by unnoticed. No, darling, you must pronounce it with a snap. See, snapping comes from a different galaxy as do all snap queens. That's right. I just ain't your regular oppressed American Negro. No, darling, I am an extraterrestrial. And I ain't talking about none of that shit you see on the movies. I have real power. I was placed here on earth to study the life habits of a deteriorating society. And when we are talking USA, we are discussing the queen of deterioration. Miss America is doing a slow dance with death, and I've been sent here to warn you all. But before I do, I must know, don't you just love my patio pants and my go-go's? I know they say white after Labor Day is a little ghost, but as the saying goes, if you got it, flaunt it. And if you don't got it, you snap to death any bastard that dares defy you. My demons are showing. Yes, child, my demons live at the bottom of my Bacardi and Coke. There's just hope for all concern. I dance my demons out before I drink them out. Cause child, <laughs> them dancing demons take you on a ride, but them drinking demons, they just take you. And you find yourself doing the strangest things. Like the time I locked my father in the broom closet. Seems the liquor made his tongue real liberal and he decided that he was going to baptize me in the word faggot over and over. And he's just going on with faggot this and faggot that all the while I walk into the broom closet to take a piss. So, my demons just took hold of my wedges and forced me to kick that drunk son of a bitch in the closet and lock the door. Three days later, I remembered he was there. <clears throat> yes. Ms. Raj is the quintessential style. I cornrow the hairs of my legs to spell out M-I-S-S-R-O-J and I dare any bastard to fuck with me. I will snap your ass into oblivion. I have powers, you know. Every time I snap, I still one beat of your heart. So if you find yourself gasping for air in the middle of the night, chances are you fucked with Miss Raj and she ain't like it. Like this time, this asshole decided to take issue with my culotte sailor ensemble. This child, this muscle-bound Brooklyn thug in a skin-tight bikini, I mean very skin-tight, so the whole world can see that instead of a brain, guy gave him an extra thick piece of sausage. You know the kind that beats up on their wives for breakfast. Well, he decided to blur out as I was walking by. Hey, look at the monkey coon in the faggot suit. So I walked up to that poor deer, very calmly lifted my hands and heart attack. 
right there on the beach. Don't believe me? Cross me. If this place is the answers, we are asking the wrong questions. I hate the people here. I hate the drinks, but most of all, I hate this goddamn music. This is not music. Give me Aretha Franklin any day. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yes. Come on and dance with Miss Raj. Last call is but a drink away, and each step brings you one step closer to the end. High rise goes up. You can't get no job. Come on, everybody. Dance and snap. A whole race of people gets trashed in the base. Come on, everybody. Dance. Some sick bitch throws her baby out the window because she thinks it's the devil. Everybody snap. New York Post. Snap. Snap for every time you walk past somebody's lying in the street smelling like frozen piss and shit and you don't see it. Snap for every crazed bastard who takes to killing himself as to get a jump on being killed. And snap for every sick motherfucker who bored with carrying around his own fears takes to shooting other people. So come on and dance your last dance with Ms. Raj. But don't be fooled by the banners and balloons because, child, this ain't no party going on. It's awake. And the casket is made out of stone and steel and glass. And the people are running around like maggots on a dead piece of meat. So come on and dance with Ms. Raj. But don't be surprised if there's nobody holding a rhythm together because we done traded in our drums for respectability. So now it's just words. Words rapping, words screeching, words flowing instead of blood, words crackling instead of fire. Because by the time the match is struck on 125th Street and you done run down to Midtown, the flame done blew away. So come on and dance with Miss Raj and her demons. We, we don't ask for acceptance. We don't ask for approval. We know who we are and we move on it. I guarantee you will never hear two fingers put together in a snap and not think Miss Raj. And that's power, baby. Patio pants and all.
Follow the bloodline. Mom fell behind. I took up the slack. Breaking my back to work off the debt. And an unthankful brother's the thanks that I get. Eyes from the sun don't look any higher. in a life under the ground. I've done everything right. Feels like I'm 40. Already the man I will be when I die. Don't bother with why. We'll scream out for more. No use on earthing the boy I was before. him up. He brings me here. I'll bring him home. There's a life I'm told to lead. Push through another year. I stick with what I'm stuck and disappear. Sinking so deep that I'm likely to drown I'll keep my head down, keep food on the shelf Keep paying for dreams I can't afford myself Eyes from the sun don't look any higher I've only begun my sacrifice years old, trapped in a life under the ground. Pick up the slack, pull on my boots, push through a year, and disappear. Alton and I were inseparable. When, when we were kids in the schoolyard and we'd be playing, we would run with our arms extend out to the side. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, synchronicity. Yeah. One day, some other kids came up saw us playing and was like, oh, all the playing with that yellow boy. He wants to play with that yellow boy because he's rich and, and he, he lives in the city limits. He was like, I play with who I want to play with and I don't want to play with y'all. Gene is my friend. And they was like, well, if you're gonna be friends with him, you can't be friends with us. And he said, I don't wanna be friends with y'all anyway. And then we took off and started running <laughs> with our arms extended. Two boys. Not a light-skinned boy and a dark-skinned boy. Two boys. Run. Running despite the, the, the summer heat. Summer heat won't stop us. Summer heat can't stop us.
Hi, Dixon Place. Thank you for tuning in to Black Artists Matter. We do. I'm going to be reading some excerpts from a book of poetry I started writing during this period of history entitled, I Held My Tongue and It Didn't Change the World. The first poem I'll be reading is entitled, Yo Pereo Sola. My heart is heavy. It hurts. I'm scared. I feel like I'm actually losing my mind. I can't spell anymore. I'm losing my memory. I got too fucked up. I'm alone. My back hurts. I'm scared. I don't read anymore. Anxiety doesn't make me groan, it makes me anxious. My titties are only gonna get longer. A wrinkle in time. Black woman, wake up and get your life, little girl. I'm a poet because I want to be, not because you told me. Who the fuck are you? I'm moving, and I don't even know how I'm going to start packing boxes. Yo pereo sola. This second poem is entitled Prenup. If you don't need me, I don't need me. That's why I stink. It's a mess in here and I want someone to clean it up. But I don't need any help. Rather, I shouldn't. Y'all be like, ask. But I'm like, would you actually help me pay my rent, buy my groceries, give me the job, beat up your relatives, say fuck your friends and join the revolution or nah? Because I could talk too. I could spew more bullshit than you, your mama, your uncle, your whole lineage could even dream of. I'm full of the shit you fed me early. So don't fucking insult my intelligence because I'll fucking embarrass you one day. Prenup. This next poem is entitled Instagram. You fucking whore, you ruined my life. I let you become me and you cajoled me into the medium. Now it's the Truman Show on that ass and I'm selling my spirit for y'all to devour for free while my soul still in my body runs on E. My instrument needs tuning, period. And my back still fucking hurts. A DM from a fuckboy or a double tap on a thirst trap will not loosen these nerves or decompress these muscles. I need a massage chair. Take me to Texas. Y'all been to the Houston airport? They play exclusively Beyonce for an extended period of time while you give the chair your coins and it goes to work. Your soul leaves your body and I damn near lost my virginity. And now I see the kids born in the 2000s posting about their black exhaustion publicizing their newly expressed heartbreak for the first time. And my heart breaks. My body gets weaker. And none of y'all deserve a thirst trap, even though I want you to fantasize about me so I don't have to touch myself. Instagram. This next poem is entitled, What the Fuck is Going On? I be seeing shit out the corner of my eye and I know it's the MS. But I haven't taken my meds and I haven't called the doctor back to get me on those meds that I'll just avoid taking once my overwhelm and exhaustion gets heavy enough. I'm waiting to fall down the stairs, die in my sleep, I can't spell, get stabbed on the street, maybe the subway, even though it's my home. I'm anticipating disposal. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready, you feel me? Living in, by, next to, alongside, adjacent to my tether. That's Gemini shit and why I don't fuck with y'all and why I'm trying to figure y'all mysteries out. I can't do that unless I'm overexerting or totally retreating. Buck up, Libra. Give me those fucking scales and toss that fake shit in the trash because you might be the cancer. Stop trying to fucking kill me. What the fuck is going on? <sighs> this next poem is entitled Flower Cloud. Remember when SpongeBob didn't get the job because he was a kid? Of course you don't. But I do. He was snubbed a promotion for being a ding-a-ling, a wing nut, a knucklehead McSpazitron. He inconvenienced himself to go on a journey so deeply rare and life-threatening, and he made friends with his fears instead. He breathed air under a hot light bulb and he died, or he didn't, and came back to save his hometown 
and his neighbors and co-workers and chosen family. And he didn't kill anyone because he couldn't. Remember seeing him dangling from the ceiling by that rope tied around his waist? In that peanut robe, wizard hat, black speedo and white cowboy boots? He needed to be dismissed, to rise, promoted, from the ashes, iconic. Flower Cloud. This last poem is entitled Weekly White Proverbs. Time's up. I cannot be silent. Now, more than ever, change is coming, for real this time. Pick your white proverb. It's as devoid of nutrients as funnel cake or cotton candy, but at least I can digest that and feel satisfied in the moment. The difference between junk food and white proverbs, because they're both empty calories, is that one is an instant comfort, while another is a crude smack in the fucking mouth. What were you doing before? Girl, what? This was just a chance to beat your meat because you felt the heat, but heat cools down, always. And we are left with the scars while you're left with our culture that we created as survival tactics. But for you to call it what it is, a life raft, you'd have to acknowledge yourself as the unrelenting sea, taking all prisoners with a smile and a, did I do that? Yes, you fucking did it, so clean it up. <laughs> Weekly White Proverbs. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. Please be safe, be diligent, be kind, be specific with your actions. Um, preserve your energy. All love. Be well. Oh, I, I forgot to get extra salt for the driveway. It's supposed to freeze over tonight. Do you, do you mind going to the store to get? I know it's so cold. Now is the winter of our discontent. Sorry. Merry Christmas! That's from Uncle Dwayne. I hope it's that new game. There's a lot of paper in there. Are there any trees left? Oh, come on, come on, come on, open it! What is it? Socks. Yay, socks! Are, are those used? What's the book? All that glitters is not gold. August! The lady doth protest too much, no thanks. Easton, you were supposed to do the dishes. I need them done now. Ah, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? No, sir. I do not bite my thumb at you, sir, but I did bite my thumb, sir. Nikki, come on. Let's go. It takes a half an hour to get there. To be or not to be? That's the question. You look nice. Girl, if you don't get in this house. Guys, bedtime. Good night. Good night. Party is such a sweet sorrow. And I shall say good night. Still, it's tomorrow. <laughs> Cocktail time! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hi, I'm Nicole. 
I'm Easton. I'm Eugene. And I'm August. We are the Sumlin family. We live in Cleveland, Ohio. My husband and I, we're both singers. We act, we direct, we dance, we write, and we're both educators. I'm in high school. I love to act, sing, dance, and draw. I'm in middle school, and I like to act, sing, and dance as well, and I like to compose music. But before all of that, we are family first. So we want to show how Shakespeare's language can fit in our everyday life. If you want to see more from us, check Eugene and I out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also see more from us on our YouTube page for Some Media Productions. There you'll find our new web series called Some Magic Theater Family Life. Thanks so much. So the first song I'm going to sing for you guys tonight is called Patience. Um, I wrote Patience as a lullaby to myself to kind of like calm down and stop thinking about the future so much. I tend to get anxiety about it. Um, but I thought it would be a, a nice song to do for you guys because it's very soothing. And we definitely need some soothing in these trying times. So here's Patience. such a human thing it's a release that we all need and um, I thought it would be a good song to perform for you all tonight because it's okay to cry I cried a couple days ago because of all the chaos that's going on right now and it's okay so without further ado <laughs> further ado here's cry <laughs> Daddy wanted, but the tears got far. 
In times such as these, I turn to the pen. For me, it is important to be able to articulate how you are feeling, if to no one else, at least to yourself. So these works I am sharing because they have brought me to a new place, or at least delivered me from an old place. My life is told in the form of the new Jim Crow. I live the effects of mass incarceration every day. In the mail, a letter from my father. I feel with mirth as I receive my father's words. Never thought that this would be the way he'd have to share his wisdom with his baby girl, his only daughter, his only child. After 10 years of seeing his face only in my memory, I wonder how much wider his crow's feet have spread. If his hair is still full and curly with a liberal peppering of gray. <laughs> After all, he was 42 when I was born. His little magical gummy bear. When I was a child, my smile was so big it would bear tiny teeth and my gums. People made fun of it, but Daddy, he adored it so much he gave me a nickname, teaching me to always appreciate those parts of me that others wouldn't. His letters, a memoir and handwritten verse, more beautiful to me than I think he originally intended for them to be. I drink in his words without pause, think about their meaning, this is just the first time I'll read them. The second will be that of understanding, the third of hearing. His character is present in every flat out. Baby girl, your old man, the verge. <laughs> I hear him saying these words. I envision him speaking them to me as we sit, palms pressed to glass, so thick no warmth can penetrate. Yet, 
the symbolism and strength of our connection is not broken. Eyes making contact that melts the black bulky phones attached to our ears and everything that surrounds the booth we are in softens. Similar to that of a dream. Even the sound of the AP system seems a far off fog. Present but easily dismissed. As its unimportance to our conversation shall not pervade our time together. Reality is punitive as he signs off. His signature abstract sailboat, hope for our reunited futures. Freedom on the eerie as we fished in days of my youth. My father, the artist, confined in concrete. His letters, the cement of our relationship. I am his greatest creation. He nurtures me little by little, letter by letter, again and again. My father will never be free, least it be through me. He works. Slave wages for slave labor. Works for another day to receive another letter from his baby girl. Lives through my account of everyday experiences stolen from him all under the guise of justice, just us. I live the effects of mass incarceration every day. Poverty denies me your face. In a political climate in turmoil, a generation of childless millennials longing for a legacy, loathing this lack of stability, dreaming of a day of peace, when the world will calm enough to birth a generation of peacekeepers. We ache for children of our own, for tranquility amongst the masses, enough of everything to live and retire? <laughs> Comfort is not an option now. To the daughter I cannot have, I yearn for your arrival. It would be inconsiderate of me to bring you here, for this time is tumultuous at best. No one will hurt you, hunt you down for your features. Who you are will never be attacked, for you are safe as you are. Here, we fight over pennies and morsels. I cannot want that for you. It would be selfish of me to usher you into this world, perfectly innocent and full of potential. I cannot let them take that from you. I must break the cycle. Honestly, I cannot afford to bear you, let alone assist you through living. I can barely provide for myself, ashamed of such modest means. But I am not alone, though I wish to be. We of child-raising age wish for abundance. A convoy of parents wading through muck. Bills, student loans, credit cards. So much debt. And yet, poverty denies me your face in a political climate and turmoil. It was the last letter I left in my sad little palm on the mail. One ordinary, clearly directed letters in the last envelope, Italian paper with your scrawl in the instruments. A thin slide thing, nothing to your turn, no sender. I still got your back, even if you're thinking that you're fucking Put me on the I still got your back, even if you're thinking that I wanna play you in love I've got rubber bands, don't you know that you and I go deep I can't walk with them, I'm running from my own soul I was trying to be cool for you
watch the cold get to man Dance until the wind blows you down See the stars, count your heart, beat, beat Hold your arms to slow it down Find the rhythm till your feet go numb Smile out until the night is gone When it's right, you know it's time to let it out It's okay to cry It's okay to lie down It's okay to close your eyes Pretend it's light out it's okay to feel a miss, keeping holes and slipping grips, but you can't hold on. Don't have to be strong. Play a song, sing along, let the neighbors hear you howling. Drink the lights through the night, set a fort and read a story. It's okay, just say it's okay, tell yourself it's okay, only you can believe it's okay, only you can relieve yourself from your pain, you gotta believe it, tell yourself it's okay, it's okay to cry. It's okay to lie down. It's okay to close your eyes. Pretend it's light out. It's okay to feel a miss. Keeping holes and slipping grips. But you can't hold on. Don't have to be strong. It's okay to cry. It's okay. I 
I'd get more than my share Then I'm caught In between knowing That you can't Give none of the same And knowing I'm wasting it Tell me, tell me how I Can't breathe Tell me, tell me how you Fool me Tell me, tell me Racism has me feeling raw today, hungry to nourish myself, swollen in the chest. A too whitey, surrendering your dream will not make you clean to the mean whinings of white children who haven't been taken care of by their own parents, and they think that if they whine loud enough, they will get what they want. Is that what their activism is? Is it a hack aloud cracker fest of talking about things while not really doing anything but yelling about them at the top of your lungs? How do you listen? No. Truly, how do you listen? I've written poetry you've performed about listening and somehow the sense does not come through. I'm through, I'm through, I'm through with white people fucking up my shit, trying to get it, make it theirs. I don't care if I have to protect this baby creation of liberation with my death. I'll sacrifice what it takes. So don't think you think you know me. Even if you heard an hour and a half sh poetry show about me, my multitudes are vast. I've been cast too much as society as this is what you must do. What I must do is protect the vision from you, the white colonizer in socialist cheap skin. Don't think I'll put this in my show. It's already in. <laughs> the tone shift. When I started hearing the tone shift from folks who knew me in my autism was when I realized the whole world is ableist. Everyone is ableist. I was ableist, ableist against myself. I want to disable the word disability. Believe me, I will always disabled, but that is also the oppressor's word. I appreciate accessibility as a band-aid to fixing capitalism, but we must disable disability. What do I mean by, by that? Please don't jump to Facebook concludes assumptions. We must disable disability. We must say it and use it and own it as we tear the world and the structures in the world down that make us disabled. The disability population is the most you know, diverse population in every you know, intersectional sense. So why don't we own our disability and self-ableism and break the wheel, disable disability, disable capitalism, disable patriarchy, disable gender binary, disable neurodiversity binary, disable all the binaries and the spectrums, TM, Time Warner, in between, disable white supremacy, disable intellectual elitism, racism and ableism, disable Disable white fragil fragility, again, racism and ableism. Disable individualism without morality. Disable external validationism. Disable presentationalism and perfectionism. Disable colonialism. Disable America. America, you are disabled. Americans, you are disabled. Disability is what it means to be human. 
Whole beings are not disabled by society. They are universal. They are communal. They are interconnected. They are respectful boundaries. They are accessibility needs, not emotional wants. They are sharing and caring in action. They are reparative, restorative, and transformative in justice. They are nurturance, culture, and universal design and learning. They are cross-collaborative, intergenerational, and fluid in design. They are us. We can be whole beings. We can be ourselves. We can be whoever we are, supported, validated, seen to each other. Thank you. When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I'll try them all I'm on your side When times get rough And friends just can't Be found like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me down Like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me down when you're down and out. When you're on the street, my Lord. When evening falls so hard, I'll comfort I'll take your part Oh, when darkness comes And pain is all around Like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me down like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me down Sail on, silver girl. Sail on by. Your time has come to shine. All your dreams are on their way see how they shine oh if you ever need a friend i'm sailing right behind like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me down like a bridge over troubled water I will ease your
New York, 2007. I was younger and love was beautiful. It meant stars in your eyes, butterflies, and meeting that one person in the world you knew instantly when you met, you'd be together forever. I blame my parents for this. They met in line at freshman orientation at the University of Maryland in August 1978 and have been together ever since. My dad said my mom was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. And my mom said my dad had crazy eyes and Peter Pan shoes. But he was a gentleman. And that's an actual quote. Armed with that source material, I frolicked into my 20s believing love was an actual fairy tale. It's how I approached every relationship. I was a hopeless romantic. Every guy I met had the potential to be the one, and I, after every date, I went home with delusions of grandeur, predicting not only future bliss, but future spats, arguments, and subsequent makeups. My imagination has always been vivid. The first man I fell in love with was 20 years my senior, tall, sweet, handsome, and had a huge penis. I was truly smitten. He lived in Connecticut and would come to visit me in New York each week. He'd take me on trips to Algonquin. And we'd stay at B&Bs and hold hands as we walked along the beach. He was really sweet and kind. And he was it, my fairy tale. When I finally got the courage to tell him that I loved him, it didn't go exactly the way that I had planned. He wasn't in love with me. To be honest, we weren't actually together. Vivid imagination. And he didn't think we could ever be. He blamed it on me having to travel all the time or that I was a lot younger or that he wasn't really looking for love. But all I heard was, I'm not in love with you. You're not good enough. And it hurt. But I was a mature 23 and I knew that heartbreak was a part of love. So I mourned our relationship for the appropriate amount of time and still refer to the man that I was never officially together with as my ex. It's easier. 2008, a little older, a little wiser, and still on a mission to find love. Enter my second love, a fairy tale of a man, tall, brown haired, with piercing blue eyes and tattooed sleeves of both arms. And to top it all off, he was a first grade teacher. Are you fucking kidding me? He was my big gentle teddy bear. In fact, we affectionately called each other Yogi and Boo Boo. We were gross. He had to move to Chicago shortly after we met and I had to take a job overseas, but that didn't stop us from keeping in touch and falling for each other, me especially. I'd fly to Chicago on my breaks to see him and I'd be in pure imaginary marital bliss whenever I was with him. He ghosted me at Christmas time that same year. He was supposed to fly to New York to be visiting me and his parents. But the entire time he was in town, I would call, text him, email him, and we'd hear nothing. Finally, being the private eye and sometimes creepily obsessive person I can sometimes be, I tracked his parents' numbers down and called them. I introduced myself as his friend and asked if he was okay as I was trying to reach him and he was supposed to be in New York visiting. His mother then kindly told me that he had already been to New York and had flown back to Chicago the night prior. I was more than heartbroken. I was devastated. I had never felt that kind of pain before. I don't think I hate anything more than being ignored, but being ignored and discarded by somebody I loved with my heart that fucking exposed was a path altering level of pain. My love again wasn't good enough. My heart wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't even worthy of a goodbye, let alone love. Who the fuck did I think I was? A pain like that is an open wound in your heart that never heals properly. It develops scar tissue. 
And over time, you can start to cautiously use your heart and that scar tissue will start to smooth out a bit. But there's always a risk that that wound will be ripped open again. And I don't want to take that risk. I decided the best way to not fuck with that scar was to just not use my heart at all. Just leave it out of the equation completely. I call this moment my awakening. My need to feel love I buried, but my need to feel wanted remained. So for the next smooth decade, I fucked my way not only around this country, but about a half a dozen others around the world. Thanks, musical theater. Feeling wanted by all those men gave me the validation I thought I needed for a very long time. But now the sex isn't validating, it's masturbatory, it's transactional. I'm having sex now because I'm bored and I want something to do. I hate this. I want more, I need more. I want to start using my heart again, but something about it feels different. It's like that scar tissue that once protected that painful wound is now turned into this thick callus. So thick and so strong that it, it feels like it won't allow my heart to ever be fully functional again. Like it won't allow love to flow through it with an openness and an ease I can only remember now and longing. Sometimes I think it will prevent me from not only loving someone, but loving myself. Is that a side effect too? And not using my heart and my love life all those years, did it also hamper my ability to love myself? This would be a lot easier to understand if I had something to compare it to, but... I can't honestly say I know what it feels like to love myself. I mean, I like parts of myself, but there's a lot of parts I can't stand. And if loving yourself means loving all parts of yourself, even the not so great parts, I'm just not sure my heart is capable of that kind of unconditional grace and I'm scared it'll never be. But if I can't love myself, how can I love someone else? That's what they say, right? I guess I'm just fucked. <sighs> All right, so. What are you two up for damning? Okay, that's the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, there's going to be another one of these, July 15th, another Black Artist Matter. So if you are a Black artist and you're interested in performing on this platform, uh, please email me. There is uh, an email address right below me. Uh, yes, thank you again to all of the amazing performers uh, who contributed their time and talent to this uh, incredible showcase. And that's it. Have a great night.